So we continue our journey in Canada. We head over to the western side and I'd like to welcome uh, Kevin Lambert, critical care paramedic in British Columbia. Apparently fulfills the role of paramedic, uh, paramedic practice educator. 27 year career, Kevin's filled many roles in the province from rural uh, paramedic care, para, sorry, primary care paramedic. I just know it's PCP, having been over there recently. Um, Kevin, uh, incredible as well, has recently achieved an MSc in critical care through the University of Edinburgh. Kevin, welcome. Thanks very much. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely fine. I Wonderful. can see that fine as well. Share the presentation here and uh, start off. So thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody for having me and allowing me to speak. Uh, it's nice to follow Natalie. Actually, thank you very much for that. I think you'll find some similarities in the presentations because uh, critical care in Canada is a is a bit of a different beast sometimes. So um, some similar things may emerge, uh, especially along with the weather, where one of the unanticipated consequences of minus 30 weather is um, every IV line, as soon as you get out of the ambulance, tends to freeze and things start to alarm and you have to move uh, fairly quickly to keep that from happening. So um, any of my colleagues online will kind of know what I'm talking about there. So yeah, thanks for having me. My name is Kevin Lambert and I have no disclosures and we'll just jump right into this to try to uh, keep it rolling. So yeah, I'm from British Columbia, a beautiful province. Um, we have about 5 million residents, just to put it in context, this seems to be a theme around in these presentations. So I'm glad I sort of uh, followed the same tack. Um, we have about 5 million residents, so similar to Scotland or perhaps New Zealand or, or other areas. And like Natalie mentioned before, we do have extremes in temperature ranges, which is just something uh, as we talk about logistics that of course, as critical care paramedics, we have to, uh, we have to contend with on a, on a daily basis as the seasons change. BC is unique is that it's also a very mountainous province so there's um, a lot of terrain issues that come into play as well and would, and uh, we can speak further to the logistics but this plays a big factor in some of the decision making that goes on in trying to uh, get our patients where they need to be let alone provide them with the care that we can uh, at the scene or en route and we also have a very concentrated population uh, and Natalie referred to this as well where you know, most people tend to live in the south for obvious reasons, I think, in Canada, but um, we do see this in British Columbia as well. And uh, British Columbia is about 900, almost a million square kilometers. And so just to put that into uh, context, and we saw from Ben earlier uh, a presentation, I just sort of superimposed this onto Australia, which is, of course, all a very large country. British Columbia fits, uh, fits nicely within Australia. But as we look at perhaps California, or even the UK, we can see that British Columbia does become um, fairly large. And you can see on that map there that, uh, you know, Paris to perhaps Inverness seems like a pretty long way. And yet that would be a pretty routine call for us to have to uh, move somebody uh, that distance. So I just want to switch and talk uh, briefly about the governance structure in British Columbia for healthcare, uh, just to give everyone some context. So British Columbia is broken down into five regional health authorities. And uh, this map sort of highlights where they are. And they just have overall governance uh, responsibility for healthcare within their area. There's also a First Nations Health Authority that oversees First Nations issues in health uh, provincially. And there's also another provincial health services authority that has the mandate to provide and coordinate things like trauma, cardiac and stroke services, and also administers BC Women's and Children's Hospital, which is located uh, in Vancouver. And under the Provincial Health Services Authority, that's also where we find BC Emergency Health Services, and that's uh, for whom I work. So just to highlight briefly, um, BC Emergency Health Services, uh, we're the sole provider of pre and intra hospital care in British Columbia, and it's been that way since 1974. There's no other uh, organizations, there's nothing else, uh, kind of no other teams providing that care within British Columbia. Search and rescue is a little bit different. There's regional or local search and rescue teams that take on that actual SAR aspect of things. Uh, we don't um, do long line rescues and stuff like that. We're, we're a medical organization uh, predominantly. Um, and because of this, we do have an excellent integration of services. It is kind of nice that um, we're pretty well coordinated right from the primary care level in a small remote town in northern BC, right up to our critical care services. Everyone um, has the same patch on their shoulder, and I think that allows for some nice coordination of services between uh, dispatch and logistics. And, uh, you know, jumping in an ambulance to assist somebody is very similar in all parts of the province. 
So here we can see a map of uh, BCEHS uh, and the 184 stations out of which we work. Um, again, this sort of also highlights the concentration of the population in that sort of southwest area around Vancouver and the southern tip of Vancouver Island, as well as some concentrations in the southern interior of BC and the Okanagan Valley. But again, most people are pretty much concentrated down in the southern part of the province. So BCEHS responded last year to just over half a million calls, different patient encounters, and that includes everything from, uh, you know, the basic routine calls uh, right up to the critical care uh, calls as well. And those critical care calls are covered out of six critical care bases, and I've highlighted those on the map here just so you can get a, an appreciation for the distribution of critical care bases. And um, yes, um, I can count, there's only five dots, but we do have two bases uh, based in Vancouver, one critical care team, and one team that I'll talk uh, briefly to, which is our um, deals with our maternal, neonatal, and pediatric population. So just to switch and cover off what a critical care paramedic is in BC, and we're going to highlight a bit of the scope and the education for critical care paramedics. CCPs in BC respond to all um, scene response and interfacility transfers, similar to the previous presentation. Um, it's we have two critical care paramedics that comprise a crew and we respond to all calls for assistance we don't have rns or physicians uh, with us on car and critical care paramedics respond to roughly around 800 calls per month in bc and that's with a workforce of about 90 critical care paramedics 70 of whom are on the adult side and roughly about 20 right now that are are trained to the maternal neonatal and pediatric population and some statistics I pulled from 2021, in that time, this group of people managed to move over a thousand ventilated transports, which is actually pretty impressive. And also, of course, during COVID, where I think everyone can appreciate the complexity that uh, that arose during that time. And uh, like I said, two critical care paramedics pretty much facilitate those transfers. So I just want to talk briefly about the scope of practice in British Columbia. It differs probably from some areas where paramedics in British Columbia actually hold their own license and there's no delegated medical authority. We don't have a physician that can, you know, like or a group of physicians that sort of look at evidence and can change or alter our practice sort of on a day by day basis. Our scope is actually defined by regulation that's held under provincial statute and there's a link there for uh, for future if anyone's interested. Um, it's not a fascinating read, but it's there if you want to take a look. Um, there have been some changes recently enacted, which is very beneficial because, as you can imagine, having your scope of practice defined in law can be a little bit cumbersome and slow to respond. But um, there are some, some things in there that do tend to make it a little bit easier to respond, and I'll highlight some of those in a second. The last thing I wanted to mention is that there is a legal versus an operational scope of practice where, while well, the legal practice is defined by statute and regulation, the BCEHS itself and our clinical advisory group and the physicians and paramedics can um, alter that scope uh, as needed. They can't exceed it, but they can sort of put some parameters around it to help uh, make sure that everything is operating safely. And that's for all level of paramedics. So speaking of which, I just wanted to touch briefly on the scope and how one becomes, this sort of ties into how one becomes a critical care paramedic. So in British Columbia, we have essentially three levels of paramedic. And the first is the primary care paramedic or PCP. And this is the majority of the workforce in uh, what would be called in other areas, perhaps EMTs or a BLS ambulance. And these PCPs um, have a scope of practice that allows them to um, say, insert eye gels for unconscious patients, uh, cardiac arrest, they can initiate IVs, they can deliver oxygen-driven CPAP, and they have sort of a limited pharmacology, some of which is highlighted here that they can administer. Our PCPs are starting to uh, incorporate um, ECG monitoring and semi-recognition into their practice, and uh, hopefully that continues to grow uh, as time goes on. From the PCP scope, people will or may choose to go and become an advanced care paramedic. So, and this is similar across Canada as well, but in British Columbia, the ACP is roughly about two years of training on top of the PCP. And this provides you with the scope where you provide advanced cardiac life support, 12 leads, 
Uh, you're responsible for intubation and front of neck access, um, although not RSIs, our ACBs don't have access to paralytics currently. They can provide IOs and uh, chest decompression, and they have a more expanded scope of uh, pharmacology. The last note there is tenecteplase, which has been a recent change in the last uh, couple of years and has been uh, very successful here because the a whole population does not have timely access to a cardiac catheterization lab. So administering TNK to people suffering a STEMI is a pretty important step. And we've managed to, uh, to reduce door to needle time significantly in communities with ACPs. The last point for ACPs here is that in British Columbia, our ACPs are targeted to practice. We don't have ACPs everywhere. They get sent uh, based on call coding to uh, specific calls where an ACP is more likely to be required and can be canceled or kept coming by a primary care crew after an initial assessment. So that just um, puts the groundwork there for where the paramedic level is sort of at the street uh, level for British Columbia. And as we switch over to discussing the critical care paramedic scope, um, there's a few things that uh, I just wanted to highlight that is in scope that's probably not uh, not news to anybody. I think this is probably pretty common for CCPs in lots of places, but our critical care paramedics um, have advanced airway options, um, conduct RSIs, can insert arterial lines, chest tube management. Uh, mechanical ventilation is, of course, a huge portion of um, critical care both our training and our, our work. So we spend a lot of time um, discussing and working on mechanical ventilation and anesthesia planning. Um, we use incubator use for our, for our baby team. And we have uh, blood product administration is something to highlight as well. And we do carry um, packed red blood cells on most of our helicopter resources now or with our critical care crews by fixed wing as well. And uh, in one base, and, and we're, we, we keep working to, to look at evidence and expand as we can, uh, we carry thawed plasma as well. So critical care paramedics are responsible for interpreting some laboratory and radiological data that suits their practice. Uh, obviously, we're not radiologists, but uh, knowing enough to be able to develop a treatment plan is important. Uh, central venous catheter management, transvenous pacing, and esophageal manometry. And I alluded to, and I even put a fancy little star beside it. So some recent changes that have come into play with our scope of practice are going to include these things that we're starting to ramp up training for and look at things uh, as we switch to finger thoracostomy for decompression away from uh, needles or in, in conjunction with uh, needle decompression, chest tube insertion, central venous insertion, escharotomy, and pericardiosynthesis. So these are all now within the legal scope of practice for critical care paramedics. And of course, because everybody likes pictures of the stuff you use and everybody wants to know, here's just a quick, uh, just to highlight uh, how we employ these skills. Um, these are the things that we tend to use in British Columbia. We've had the Zolex series for a while. Um, we've switched in the last couple of years to the Hamilton. And we've just recently switched to the Bebron IV pumps, which most people seem to be in favor of and, and work pretty well. Not an endorsement, just, uh, just my experience. Uh, we also have um, frontal EEG monitoring provided by the Massimo SED line uh, as an option for anesthesia and for mental health transports. And uh, we use the Buddy Light fluid warmer to keep uh, fluid and blood warm. And we use the EPOC for a blood analyzer for point of care testing. So we're just going to jump into a quick chat on BC's critical care paramedic education. So here's one of our illustrious critical care paramedics now um, at the very beginning of his program. Yes, he is drawing with crayons, but to be fair, we just gotten out of the pool uh, after hours and hours in there for uh, underwater egress training. So that, that's fair. And um, as we move on, I just thought I'd talk quickly about the selection and how one becomes a critical care paramedic in BC. So we select from our practicing ACP groups, and I mentioned that that's, a, that's about two years of training above the primary care paramedic role in BC. And these people undergo a mini, uh, multiple mini interview or you know, kind of like OSCEs, perhaps people have uh, participated in similar things just to assess their ability to respond to various scenarios. And then for our selection, we actually have some challenge exams that people do. And we have a partnership with a provincial uh, nursing training organization uh, institute that uh, has some core programs within it. And we ask our ACPs to challenge three of those courses in a compressed time frame after reviewing the material very quickly. And, and this is stuff that really isn't out of scope for an ACP, but it, it does push their, their ability to quickly uh, learn and integrate knowledge and then write some exams on, on some basics of critical care just to assess their suitability to come into the, uh, into the program. 
And uh, after that, places are awarded and people jump into our critical care paramedic education program. For that program, we take a simple to complex um, uh, approach. I think that's probably pretty common everywhere. And our CCP program overall takes around two years to complete. And it's a blend of classroom time, time in the ICUs around uh, British Columbia, and of course, an extensive practicum with a lot of uh, what we call on-car time or preceptorship on the various, um, at the various CCP bases. And our training is, um, we like to think it's very successful because we have a great uh, integration with a lot of specialty physicians, ICU physicians, and subspecialties that we um, ask to come in and train specific topics for our, for our CCP students. And it's been quite, um, quite beneficial for us to establish these relationships and, uh, and, and glean uh, from their experience. So how we break down our training is we break it down into the core CCP training. It's about 14 months. It's broken down into three semesters. And this results in critical care paramedic licensure within BC, but it doesn't allow people to work uh, independently in practice. Following the core training, um, CCP students go into this uh, specialization and there's two streams here. One is focused on adult critical care and one is focused on the maternal, neonatal and pediatric population. And this varies from around seven to nine months, roughly eight months. And the whole point of this specialization is to produce practice ready critical care paramedics that can go out and just and start working. So just to break down the core CCP education for you, in semester one, we really focus on the non-attending role where the students aren't responsible for drafting treatment plans or the diagnostics, but they learn the equipment and they learn how to facilitate a treatment plan given to them by their preceptor or uh, whoever they might be working with. We spend a lot of time discussing and integrating the concepts of human factors and crew resource management right from the beginning of our program. So much so that uh, CRM, we've actually verbed CRM and did you CRM it is a, is a pretty common phrase uh, within BC just to make sure that that's not being missed in any case. So this is about five weeks in class. There's a lot of knobology, pushing buttons on things, learning how to use it so that they can be um, useful in, in a setting where they, where they can start to change their practice from ACP and get introduced into these um, probably unfamiliar, unfamiliar pieces of equipment and integrate into the critical care environment. They go on car for a few weeks just to sort of integrate those skills before they come back for semester two, where we get into simple single system cases. Um, a lot of the training over eight weeks in class in ICU, it's very heavy eight weeks. Um, it's very common for, let's say we have a few days, four days of cardiology training. It'll tend to be lectures in the morning from a cardiologist or one of our ICU uh, physicians that we work with. And then we'll take the afternoon and perhaps go into the CSICU or the ICU and do some assessments on patient and employ some of the skills that were learned that morning. And we find that that integration works well. Of course, there are exams throughout the process. And following the semester two, students go on car and learn to start uh, assessing patients, drafting problem lists, and coming up with um, uh, therapeutic options to, to deal with things and communicate with uh, ICU um, leadership as well as other, um, uh, sorry, other uh, communicate with the ICUs to which they'll be transporting. In semester three, they come back in class and we cover special patient populations and focus on pediatrics, geriatrics, bariatric patients, and some of the, some of the individual things that go along with those populations. This isn't the be all and end all, um, and we'll see in a bit uh, how we cover this in a little bit um, greater detail, but this is about five weeks in class and then, and then students go back on car again, and they're responsible for sort of everything they've seen. They'll be asked to sort of take the lead on attending all of these calls. Following the core training, we jump into what we call a CCP fellowship. And as I mentioned before, there's two streams. We have the adult stream, which takes about eight months to complete. There's about an additional seven weeks in the classroom or the ICU. And this focuses on more complex cases, multi-trauma, patients with comorbidities. Um, there's more OR time. We spend a, a week on ECMO training to help facilitate those transfers, which will tend to do with two critical care paramedics and a perfusionist. We do more advanced ultrasound training like rush exams 
And a lot of this is actually focused around integration into the ICU, where our students will actually go and do consults in the emergency department, come up with a treatment plan, report out to the doctor as if they're in a sort of a, a real life and yet simulated transport environment where they're responsible for those assessments and communications and enacting a plan and uh, taking patients up to the ICU within the same hospital. So there's safety there because of course the physicians are present, but it gives them a chance to really go in like they would in a smaller center and start at the beginning in terms of assessments and treatment. Um, then they then go on car for about five months working in a two person configuration. All calls throughout the program are evaluated. They also participate in a rural rotation where they go for a week and uh, work in a rural site just to gain some insight into how that functions. And they participate in case reviews and exams. And finally, there's a field evaluation at the end of fellowship. And then uh, assuming they're all successful, they're considered to be job ready. The fellowship, and I won't dwell on this too much because I'm not uh, a maternal, neonatal, or paramedic, or pediatric paramedic, um, or colloquially here, we call them infant transport team or ITT. But it's a very similar process where they go into uh, BC Women's and Children's and other hospitals. They tra train extensively in anesthesia, get a lot of time in the NICU and PICU, and low and high risk maternity patients. And they participate in three and two person practicums, have exams, and then they graduate as well. Following training and for um, practicing paramedics, we do have a maintenance of competency program. We log exposure profiles for calls throughout the year, all CCPs do, just to see um, that people are being exposed to certain clinical cases. We undergo quarterly training in various topics that change with each, with each quarter. And we do have annual training to address any exposure shortfalls that are seen in the exposure profile. We also have access to ORs for dedicated OR time for to go in and uh, practice anesthesia, intubation, uh, have some time with an anesthesiologist to discuss cases. And lastly, I'm almost finished, but I thought I'd touch briefly on our operations. And um, because no presentation like this would be complete without more pictures of aircraft and whatnot. Um, Similar to in Ontario that we heard about, we have a very dynamic uh, way of working here. We're not, we're not tied necessarily to one particular mode of transport. We can end up facilitating calls by ground ambulance. We have a fleet of fixed wing ambulances throughout the province that we use uh, to get to more distant areas. And then we do have a smattering of different types of airframes for rotary wing resources as well that we utilize throughout, uh, throughout the province to provide both inter-facility transfer and HEMS services. And we even sometimes get to jump in the hovercraft to cross the Salish Sea, which is uh, super fun. It does have a Keurig on board if you need a coffee, so that's very, uh, very helpful. And just briefly, um, our mission profile here only about 30% of our calls are primary scene response or auto launch, as we call it here, calls. 70% is interfacility transfer, some of which is trauma, but again, a lot of ACS patients, septic patients. Uh, I'm sure you've all seen a different, um, different types of patient presentations that need to be moved around the province because we do have regionalized and centralized uh, specialty care. And just to finish up, what challenges do we face in British Columbia? Well, I mentioned it before, logistics are a big issue. We have time pressures both from crew and pilot uh, day, um, uh, length of day parameters we have to fit in these calls. Our calls can take you know, anywhere from four to eight to 12 hours or beyond to try to facilitate some of these because of the terrain and weather that we run into. And of course, like a lot of places, we do have resource issues where um, we have to prioritize the calls we go to. And call selection becomes a factor here. We we it's not uncommon to have competing calls. If you have somebody in with a STEMI and cardiogenic shock versus a multi-trauma, they're both coded the same way as a red call, but which one do you go to first? And we do uh, have a critical care paramedic advisor housed in our provincial center for air ambulance dispatch that uh, tries to help facilitate this and provide a bit of a bridge between the logistical side of things and the medical side of things and participates in conferences to try to help decide uh, how these cases should unfold. And the last challenge we have, and Natalie mentioned this as well, is credentialing in Canada. It's something we need to continue to work on to approach a level that we see in uh, other places where we think that advanced credentialing in terms of bachelor and master's degrees is definitely uh, reasonable for critical care paramedicine here. 
And we also, of course, just want to continue to improve our QI process. And I think we've seen some great presentations and we'll probably try to steal some of their ideas as we go forward. So that's about it. Um, happy for any questions. There's me hard at work, um, but there's probably a better picture right there. So thank you. I'm sorry if I'm over time, but uh, happy to take any question. Hey, Kevin, thanks ever so much for that. I think that final pitch, and I, I, don't, I don't know, maybe the hovercraft, you might have just tipped the uh, the western side of Canada over the east. Um, just a couple of questions, if that's okay. Um, the extended scope uh, skills that you're working on, uh, what, why is that? Is there just an increase in incidences or...? No, I think that's a natural continuation of things that haven't been in scope for a long time. I think these are, I mean, obviously, you know, I think I put things like escherotomy up there that is that is um, that has been added to the scope after consultation with various groups around the province. You can imagine how hard it is to change provincial regulation. And so there's a lot of, there was a lot of feedback that went in from practitioners in different groups. I'm not sure that that's a very uh, that that would definitely be a halo event. So I don't know how extensively we're going to to train or go into that, um, but it is something that that could occur. It's not. I wouldn't say it's it's super evidence based. I think it's more uh, experience based. Uh, some of those things that went in, and the fact that things like central venous line insertion and chest tube insertion are on the table now for us, I think reflects the remote nature of the work we do. And there's a lot of times where your presence in a community is providing really the first opportunity for sort of the next level of care. And that's no disrespect to the clinicians that work there. It's just, of course, they're they're a lot of times understaffed and and they just have limited resources so it's something we can bring to the table to to help people yeah brilliant listen kevin thank you ever so much for your time it was a, a absolutely fantastic presentation wasn't many landscape shots though like like you had over in the east that's all i'll say i was worried that if i put more in we'd start just poaching ccps from all over the world <laughs> so i didn't want to go too crazy this is brilliant.